Thanks for coming along, and uh, today we're going to have a talk from Bob Layson uh, entitled uh, Empirical Knowledge and Armchair Economics. Yes, and it will be very enlightening, which the room could do with. I can uh, <laughs> Very good. Um, uh, uh, um, how do I start? Someone in the world, within the last ten minutes, farted. No. What's that <laughs> Sounds like a lot of I can, I can produce further evidence if need be. The point being, is that a priori or empirical? In my sense, in a sense, it has to be empirical. But does anyone doubt that it is the truth? That's as an opening shot. Um, how much can a, an economist or a philosopher economist learn of the world? If he's shutting a room and um, seeing very little apart from what he sees in the window, possibly. Well, no, not a great deal. Something in mathematics, possibly, but that, that would have to be stimulated by the works of mathematicians, which he may not have. But the economic situation is a little different. We, um, we get out of our rooms occasionally. Uh, we already have, if we look up the subject, we have theories coming at us from several angles explaining how some things are um, just and useful and others are a question of exploitation and uh, it can be far better to do it. But, but as with the breaking wind instance, that is not a priori, but it's certainly true. And does anyone doubt it? No. Very good. So we can have a surety of some things almost without going ha having to go and check. Other things those things that are purely analytic, though it's not always obvious in one is studying something that ends up being a, a long way around to a tautology. Uh, those are sometimes not obvious, and yet they are undoubtedly true. So let us get to the armchair. Ooh, it's armless, it's armless, but it'll do. Oh. The armchair um, economists. He may have read works of other people, but he, he doesn't um, have to really... Well, it helps to read other people, because they, they do a lot of thinking for you. But he realises that um, the idea of opportunity cost, the idea of, uh, of well, other costs, if we're in a monetary economy, all these things can be um, worked up, as it were, without having to look out of the window. But the, obviously the idea... Was it one of the... Was it James I? It was said of him that he thought it would be an idea to have a baby kept in a cellar and no one speak to it for 20 years and then find out if it spoke Hebrew, <laughs> which is the natural thing, you know, for God's children to do, I presume. I hope he didn't try it out. But uh, that, that would be a kind of um, innate uh, knowledge or a priori knowledge, knowledge apart from experience. But um, luckily I don't think he did that. How then can the, um, the armchair economists... I, I allow him to have um, access to a library and, uh, and a window to look out of. But what, what can an armchair economist do when he can come up with the, um, the idea of opportunity cost, which is a great deal of um, economics, um, of scarcity, of course, of incomes accruing to those who provide services all of these things. Uh, money has to enter at some point. But back to the more basics. Um, and after um, studying some years in my own way, I come to the come to the position of being a kind of um, bastier. Uh, it was said of him by who did say of him. The Austrian economist, my Schumpeter? over here, Schumpeter, the very man. He said of Schumpeter, or Schumpeter, or Schumpeter. Schumpeter. He said, he said, I do not hold that Bastiat was a bad theorist. I hold that there's no theorist. Yeah. Um, which is something we we'll put down. You might have thought. He, he thought he was useful in other ways. He liked mathematics for telling little stories. Schumpeter loved mathematics. And. Uh, I think I'm, I'm in a, a kind of a, of a Bastier position. Um, 
And let me explain how. Uh, the study in which I'm sat in my armchair is not windowless. In other words, I have access to see what's going on around the world. I even have access, perhaps, to books of economics, though I must, I may think very little of them, and some of them deserve thinking very little of. We can, ha we can um, understand the, ob the idea of opportunity cost to ourselves. We can... Uh, we can conclude that economics has an empirical subject about which it need know nothing. Which, in a sense, you don't need to know anything. You say, is there, is there private property? Is there freedom of contract? Is there a good that is being used as money? And almost of necessity, there will be. It may not be called such things, but in order to have exchange, uh, the valuing of plans, valuing the, of the success of plans carried in, into operation, uh, it is necessary to have calculation. And this uh, does not require, to come to this conclusion, does not require a great study of um, various attempts at, around the world to do things slightly differently. Are you there? Okay. Well done, Pat. So what, what makes me a kind of um, mutual aid Kropotkinite or a Frederick Bastia Harmony fellow is the idea of peaceful interdependence. And um, so-called do-nothingism, in reality, is specialist producers going at it like hammers and tongs <laughs> and hard at it. In other words, so-called do-nothingism as regards the actions of a central state attempting to run an economy is utterly unnecessary because people are, are doing it for themselves, as it were. And so am I a theorist at all? Am I a bit like Bastia? Do I just um, go through examples, imaginary and actual? Uh, Chomsky would have to say that Faraday wasn't a theorist. That is true, <laughs> because Faraday didn't like mathematics. Clark Maxwell did. Uh, so, what does harmony require? Well, it doesn't require um, optimal levels of this, that, or the other. It simply requires peaceful coexistence of um, competitors and non-competitors. Uh, you may learn from others, you may learn to do different to what others do. Some people can be no end of an education. Trade needs no politics. CF, the American president. All that trade requires is a good, the clue is in the name, good, and a means of transport. There is no need for trade to be organized by um, the authorities in any way. Uh, contract and people adjusting to using currencies, currencies they trust is all that is required. Which is not really joined together, is it? Never mind, we can do that in the question period. Um, so in what sense is it a bad thing to be without a great deal of theory as we suppose that uh, Bastier was. He did try to get theory in. Uh, I've read his uh, Economic Harmonies, uh, a very big fat book, which he didn't have time to finish, and there's something in it, a great, a great many words are in it. But uh, I, I think I've said elsewhere, on another occasion, that he was a, a, rather interesting because he had a, he had a not having to engage in labour theory of value. In other words, if you find a pearl in the bed of a stream, pick it up, you have a very valuable object, and yet you've done nothing. Just spotted it out of the corner of your eye. 
Well, why? Because it would take a great deal of labour to send people off and try and find another one. You'd have to pay them a good deal. So, if you wanted, that would be a kind of cost theory of value. But of course, it didn't cost you anything, so it shouldn't. How dare you sell it for a good deal? Because it saves the people who want it a great deal of um, labour on their part, or on behalf of others who they would have to pay to engage in it. So, uh, a, a great deal of um, ignorance in the world uh, is sure and certain, our own and that of others. And for the most part, it does no harm, since if they did know, they might want to get involved, or they might disapprove it, or something. So, our own plans integrate with the plans of others, for the most part, because, uh, well, we don't like to use what is not ours, or to treat people in ways that they don't approve of. Again, a perfect integration. So what is empirical and a priori here? The empirical is simply um, other people, other views, other attempts. That's empirical in the way of finding out of the um, means employed. <coughs> but the uh, a priori is what? Well, apart from such as you can't be in two places at once. Um, and what use is it? Well, we know that um, bigger and smaller, lesser and greater, further and nearer, all of these things um, are such as used to interpret the world and very necessary. And they're not, not well, say so Kant, I think it's right here, they're not obtained from experience. We, put, we interpret experience in such a way that these, these make sense. Can, uh, can, you, can the essential truths of economics be learnt in a windowless study? I mean, is it, is it enough just to, um, just to sit and think? No, I think we'd have to know that other people exist. <laughs> I think that they would be useful. Um, you know, if we were fed by machinery or something, you know, we'd, we'd just think there was, a, I don't know what, an agent? We might think there was an agent in the next room, especially if the quality of the food varied from day to day. And sometimes it was much better and sometimes it was much worse. But um, that's not my pigeon old thing, as uh, people say. One thing that is done without, uh, it is thought that there must be a theory on how to best run an economy. Well, of course, that, that's something I, I deny uh, vehemently. Um, the economies need no running. Producers plan, of course, and their plans go well or badly. People copy from others, yes, indeed. Uh, is there need uh, for a plan? Is there need for trade needing politics? No, refer to the good and the means of transport. Are classes set at war because there are Goods and good producers? Certainly not. Competition is a regular education. What about um, democratic control? Surely you're, all of this is just a bit uh, dog eat dog. No. Uh, do dogs do not, generally speaking, eat dog, I don't think. <laughs> eat horses, don't they? <laughs> well, they sniff each other's arses, but <laughs> that we need not go into. Um, how to pull this together? Uh, obviously, our study with our armchair in it has to have a window and several, and perhaps a few television channels and a telescope and other things. Um, to say, and of course, I think one lifetime would not be enough to get the get the basic the basics right. Uh, the, the world outside where we're merely um, how can I put it? Really showing how right we are. If we're right, I'm not sure that's, that's how rightness works. We, see, we would see instances of um, opportunity costs, of uh, evaluation, of market exchange, of swapping, which is an, an earlier form. The, uh, but it's thought a bad thing 
to have uh, such armchair priori, a priori views of uh, what these is the essence of economics. Mm -hmm. uh, this was this was of course affirmed by um, Mises that, or rather, what he affirmed was that one could do it, <laughs> and he certainly did in, in, in several fat books, about which I'm becoming increasingly impressed. I have to say, with age, I thought he was a dull old dog, but um, listening to a wonderfully young, long uh, biography of him, read by a German academic, read very well about his escape from France and his time in it. it was great fun. Anyway, but I recommend it if you can, if you can get a listen of it. Um, yeah, I do recommend it. So the name of the... Oh! The name of the biography is called Mises. Yeah. That's it's just called Mises. That's right. I've got it, it's a very big fat thing. Yes, I feel it. I brought it for that talk on Mises. I brought it on Mises. You didn't read it all, did you? I did, yeah. I <laughs> more than once. <laughs> At the meeting? No, no. Oh, not at the meeting, no. no, no, no. I didn't so, bring it to the meeting. How do you spell it? How do you spell Mises? M-I-S-E-S. Mises, right. Mises, well, yeah, some people have pronounced it Mises. Yeah. Uh, to return to theory and economics, Economies need no theory of how best to run them. Obviously, the basics must be there. Security of property, money trusted by the various persons, freedom of contract and the rest. Uh, it's thought that there ought to be a theory of how to run them. A theory of how to run an economy or manage an economy. Um, so so if, if they need no running, then they need no theory of how best to run them, I would have thought, ought to follow, which is um, my view. How does this how does this compare with the uh, interventionist model? Well, of course, with the interventionist model, there is no comparison. But also, you don't just get um, economic intervention; you're also going to get nationalism, the state, uh, preparations for wood uh, defence, which means all sorts of weapons to be used offensively if need be. Modern economists are obliged to have data, or data, it almost sounds like they're American, but I think they mean data, a model, data fits into the model, a forecast, and um, policy recommendations. Uh, but under um, a system where property and freedom and self-interest is all that is required, uh, there is no need for the data. Uh, this is back to the empirical, but the empirical, in the modern sense, it's thought that you, just, you have to have data. data that just, you find out what's going on, right? Well, with a market economy, you know what's going on. In general, you may not know the latest share price, or you may not know tomorrow's share price. You may, be, may have got a right guess about it. But that is not, um, the, the knowledge worth acquiring is knowledge of acquired in time and place, in specialist labor, specialist production. A bit of, bit of good luck can help, of course. Your B side, your B side that you weren't sure about may be far better than the A side. There will be, um, there will be failure, practical and financial, particular and concrete. But success will also be in the particular and concrete. It, it requires no theory of running a market, or even much of a theory of how markets evolve through time, because we pretty much can grasp the idea of individual success, success of firms, practical improvements, and a great deal of ignorance too. Um, some people are so ignorant of the of their chances of being successful, or they take a gamble and are successful, even though the, the odds are very much against it. Let's draw this rag bag to a conclusion. Um, one of the conclusions is complexity is in the world. 
and an economist's head is simple by comparison. Uh, Bastiat had no theory at all. Well, he did have a theory. His theory was that it is not required to manage an economy, therefore there had to be no theory of how best to do it. Yeah, lots of theory, you just didn't have any mathematics, that's what I was trying to say. Well, that's what they're really objecting to, I suppose, but um, I, th I think he just thought it was too easy. They thought it was a, uh, how to put it, he took a, 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 well, a, 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 a didn't see the mathematics applied. You know, some people did, that's the difference between them. Oh, well, yeah, well actually, you're right. Uh, the, how do you measure, in, apart from liking and disliking and liking something better or less, or where's the, how can the maths get in? It's it's selection. There's a product, selection process well, is going. Actually, Wittgenstein explains it in the common sense of political economy, and that is a more or less calculus in words. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it does apply, but you don't have to refer to the mathematics. You, you know, it's, it's, not, it's ridiculous to, to say that there's no theory in Bastia. Obviously, theory in Bastia, yeah, just like the theory in Faraday. To conclude, when did he commence? You're thinking. Um, we know there must be failure, practical and financial, particular and concrete. We know how practical improvements are made, if only in general and in the abstract. Uh, there is no need for economies to be managed. There is no reason why one must proceed by data model forecast and policy recommendation. Oh dear, save us from policy recommendations. There is no need for policy recommendations, there's need for saving, invention, successful invention, successful development, successful improvements. These are all practical matters. There will be theory used in them, there chemistry in all the rest of it. All the sciences may be used, but there's no need for science of economics to be used, and apart from, as in the case of Bastia, to, to get people to see the folly of certain forms of um, state intervention. And there I end. Thank you. David? Just. <laughs> it's the hand dry next door. David? Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, lots of questions. Uh, you said uh, in passing in the course of your talk secure property rights and so forth being taken for granted <laughs> and my question is this uh, we have Austrian economics as the exemplar of working out economics from first analytic a priori type principles. Can you do the same thing with the structure of the property rights and the courts and the legal system that, that is needed for our a priori economics to work? Or is that the point at which you have to get out of your study and into the world and gather data? Or is there an exercise that remains to be done, a sort of Austrian economics of, of law and even moral principles and so forth? Or is your underlying proposition really limited to the economics and the rest is a bit tricky? Well, I think to have found ourselves in the happy position of living in a society which is pretty much a commercial one, um, in a sense, solves that problem. I mean, of course, it had to have started. Yes, of course, it had to have started. And it may have been started uh, ruthlessly or by invasion or all, all kinds of deplorable things. It doesn't have to. It may be that sometimes it did. But in the end, the important thing that there are, there is private ownership, and some people may have a lot and some people may have a little. But... Um, you don't suffer from the, the, the property of other people, for the most part. You gain from it, if it, if it is being put to use, as, um, as it almost certainly will be. Uh, sadly, if it's put to use by some nobleman just to 
you know, display his cattle or something. The other side of the... Uh, yes, that, that may be deplorable, but uh, we don't have to start from scratch. All we have to do is just... Since there won't be socialism, we don't have to fight it particularly. Since there will be commercial production and exchange, we have to, in a sense, say how it works and why alternatives to it would not work nearly so well, if at all. Um, something of that kind. But you're right, there will, there will have to be, and some, maybe that some, some, some societies never quite get that far. They, I mean, sorry, just as a follow-up, if somebody were to say, well, yes, I agree with you about economics, but all this requires a, it requires a, a society that, that respects the rule of law, that has some sort of working system for adjudication, some system for enforcement, some system for working out the fine detail of what the commercial rules need to be. Is any of that stuff capable of being worked out? If somebody says, well, what should that be? Can that be worked out a priori? There are, or is that oh, there are areas and times in history where people almost have to come together and, and wing it. They're not, they have no authorities above them. Well, they may be in a prisoner of war camp or something, but it may be that they simply have to trust one another and have means of um, getting payment and suffering, meeting out punishment for those who don't keep their word, that kind of thing. Uh, whether that's enough to, but that that would normally occur to people who have been raised in a one a society more like the one you speak of, perhaps, and it may take it may take a long time. I don't I, I don't study a very ancient history. Um, yeah. yeah. Extreme a priori economics faces a terrible propaganda problem when approached by politicians. How do you know? I just sit here, think about it. Okay, what shall I do then? Nothing. <laughs> Obviously the politicians can go somewhere else where, where they can find an economist who says, well, I've done all this research and I'm good, and I, you should do this and this and this. Well, sadly, most economists, of course, are, do see that as their task, yes. to give advice to government um, apparatchiks, to the ministry, to, um, run, to help run the economy, to have, for example, the right monetary policy, not, not look down and see what the people are using as money and say, oh, that's fine, yeah, you seem to have settled on something there, units of something or other, made by someone or other, it was a purity, that seems to work rather well, carry on, good show. But, of course... They're going to get themselves voted into office repeatedly and stay so. They meet, they eventually capitulate to um, the idea, since it's now the idea. Uh, economists like to think they're very useful, and uh, politicians like to use them to show that they are virtuous and concerned for the public well being. And so, between the two of them, they, um, they inflate, <laughs> they uh, go for boom, boom and bust, and they go for. Uh, central banking. I mean, the idea now is that uh, things are financed into existence. It's just, just financed. The idea that the stuff has to be put together, you know, moulded, uh, adjusted, treated, that many skills come together to make something. No, 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 the, the important thing is, is that they're financed. So we should thank God, thank the banks. Thank the banks for um, what they've done over the last 10 years. Thank the, uh, the ministry, thank the treasury, because they're giving us demand to keep the whole show on the road there. Um, what do we do? And, and, and of course, the politicians look virtuous and well advised. The advisors look clever and virtuous as well. Uh, it, it's a wonderful setup for them. They they never look for um, <coughs> alternatives. They don't look for refutations, particularly. The, this is everyone's doing it. You have to have, for example, a central bank to maintain demand or ensure growth or something or other. Um, none of this, and, and, and for an, even from an armchair, I think you can ex explain why this is wrong. You may have to have looked out the window 
many times. But uh, no. Anyone else? Oh, oh. So, so if I, I, I find I'm not an economics student at all, so this is difficult for me. But I think is your argument saying that we, the market should determine. We don't need we don't need any theoretical knowledge of of, of economics at all. The markets will just be what they are. Yes, uh, economists are not very good. They know they're not experts on economizing, in particular disciplines or trades, forms of manufacture. They're just not very good. They may be by chance also good at that, but they're certainly not trained to be good at that kind of thing. Sure. They can be of use when they see that there is a, a product which is not regularized, like if seas are overfished or if there is pollution, there, there should be, you know, if there are externalities or, or there should be, there should be, in other words, they're, they're quite good at introducing a market or arguing to introduce a market where there wasn't a market before. That often improves the situation. But I do think that, um, you know, the, the, the private ownership is the way to go pretty much. Not, I don't think everything, I don't see how can there be agreements to leave things alone? As with Antarctica so or something? A little bit of a follow on from that. So what about sort of meta trade, like financial markets and insurance and things like that, which there's no real good traded. Is there, in the vast majority of it, it's just like uh, like the options market, options on contracts. I don't have any idea how these things work, but they're, they're virtual risk devices, aren't they, that people trade. And, and, and yeah. economists are pretty well into all of that, and they they allow you to predict and make profits in those environments, don't they? That can act to smooth out things that otherwise would not be so smooth. But I have a great deal of doubt about much many of these instruments, and certainly the way they are um, aided and abetted by central banks to um, mm -hmm. you know, to ensure that they have enough credit. Now I've argued elsewhere, because or stated. Paid by banks to, you know, to, to pretend that. <laughs> no, no, but, but if you're if you're if you're billions in something, you want to want some good advice. You're going to want some prediction of how it might behave. You won't get it from the Yeah. Well, where do you get some? Well, well, financial advisors. Well, you have to make your own inquiries. They're generally not economists. Actually, aren't they the same thing? Oh no, I've never met a I've never met a. Financial advisor who's a red egg in economics. So I don't understand what you mean when you say there aren't any products. I mean, yes, of course there are products. Insurance is a product. Uh, An option is a product. There yeah. are products. Now, I entirely agree with Bob that, that to, to, a, to a significant extent, those financial markets are parasitic on what governments do. So, the classic example is the government bond market. Mm -hmm. I mean, that market is just a, it wouldn't exist and it shouldn't exist. But there are plenty of other financial markets which make perfect sense, which have nothing to do with what governments do. And they involve complex, not that complex actually, but they do involve second level financial instruments, but they make perfect sense because there are, there's somebody who wants to reduce their risk, there's somebody who wants to take off that risk, they do uh, a trade. Uh, I, I don't think I'm not, one has to be slightly careful about being overly critical of, of all of those markets as, uh, as being parasitic on what governments do, or as being sort of pointless or useless or wasteless. I've no objection to them, I've every objection to central banks of course, yeah, yeah. aiding and abetting them. Or, Absolutely. Yeah, or, or helping them out, because it would be a terrible thing if some giant firm collapsed and maybe contagion or something, something of that sort. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm again in there. Insurance. Oh, insurance. Oh, insurance is fine. Uh, but obviously, I'm, I can recommend the most depressing book I ever read, <laughs> The Everything Bubble. It's a chap predicting um, another burst of what we suffered in uh, 10 years ago now, 2008, was it? Mm. And the bailouts. And he says, yes, there will be bailouts, there will be bail-ins. 
There will be more hyperinflation. There will. They're going to get your money. <laughs> it will be made. Uh, large denominations will be withdrawn. It will be difficult to get gold or silver. They want you to have your money in a bank. Well, admittedly, it's not even not even paper there, but still, so that they can inflate uh, inflate it away. Sadly, not just inflate it away, but also have just take large parts of it because they say they will say. We depend upon the financial system. It upholds everything. We cannot allow the financial system to... John? I once asked David Barker uh, whether, to what extent it would be possible to abolish taxation and simply replace it with seigneurage in some form, which is this idea of... You simply keep printing money, quantitative easing, and whatever the government needs to do. There are ways of manufacturing the money without actually troubling anybody for it. And then let, let, let's, let them, uh, he assured me, uh, on the basis of his expertise, because I couldn't really follow his PhD economics explanation, that seniorage is a tiny percentage of taxation. It would be utterly impossible to... Uh, abolish taxation and have that. Just at the moment, because the banks get far more than proportionally than they used to when the state had it all. Um, mm -hmm. um, Anyone else? Well, can I, the uh, of um, the chair. I remember a conversation me and David still had around about 1971 thereabouts. When we were looking at this big fat book, Human Action, and the advocacy that it was all a priori. And we agreed it's almost instantaneously that not much of that was a priori. But if you just take your know, one concept, opportunity cost. The opportunity cost, my opportunity cost, is contingent upon me. Uh, my opportunity cost and your opportunity cost would be different. Uh, it's a subjective thing which is contingent upon the, the, the given individual. Uh, and I, I think you know, Freud wrote this book, uh, wrote this little essay uh, on the dogma, uh, the two dogmas of, uh, of empiricism, uh, you know, talking about uh, analytic and de priori statements. And he said basically, and I think he's right here, that you can't, it's fairly hard to tell the difference between them. It's a bit like genetics and environment. You know, you, you have a look at an individual and you can't tell what's being built up by the environment and what's being built up by genetics. Uh, I remember I had an accident in my uh, right uh, leg, and my right leg was tripled, and I walked. And in such a way I walked, I wore off part of the shoe like that, and I thought it was, this was down to the this accident when I was 11. I thought this was down certainly to uh, the accident I had when I was 11. But then I noticed my mother's shoes, and they were exactly the same, <laughs> worn down in the exact same way, and she had had no accident to her right foot. So presumably that was genetic. It's difficult to tell which is genetic and which is uh, uh, environmental. I think it's difficult to tell which is, which we, you know, Kant says, as you almost quoted, you know, uh, we know that all knowledge comes from experience, uh, uh, comes uh, in experience, but we don't know what comes from experience and what comes from innate. Uh, and yeah, that's right, we don't know, and it's difficult to know, I think. Um, what do you have to say to that part? Oh, uh, yeah. right, basically, I may not be able to guess your answer, but suppose you were parachuted into the Treasury and put in charge of it, and let's say that also gave you the whip hand in the um, Bank of England. What would you do? Would you simply fire everybody, or what happens next? I wouldn't start from there, I think. Is what... <laughs> right. I would... I mean, I, I would try and encourage the use of um, base, base metals, if at all possible. Uh, that's the sort of thing that in the everything bubble, the chap says, well, that, that we got rid of. High denominations go, would go, they're already disappearing from the EU. So we'd have copper currency? Uh, yeah, possible. Gold, gold coins would be worth so much. They, there are ways of wrapping them in plastic and having them electronically verified. So you could have coins pretty easily. It would be better. Um, but uh, perhaps that's for another talk. But uh, 
would it matter whether they've got somebody's face stamped on it or not? Some other impressive sort of bit of art. Well, the, no. If, if they're accepted mm. by other people, that, that's enough. That counts for a lot. Like, like cigarettes in uh, prisoner war camps or tins of sardines in... No, tins of herrings in American prisons, I believe, for some reason. They're, they're a form of currency. Mm. Uh, I suppose this is really directed at David, but I'll put the question to you. I didn't understand David's point about uh, about opportunity costs. He seemed to be suggesting that because we all have different sort of scales of uh, of, uh, of preference and costs and so forth, therefore the idea of opportunity cost becomes a sort of empirical idea. Uh, that seemed to me to be wrong. What, what do you think? Well, it's only, only empirical in the same way that having a cheese sandwich is empirical. And you can't eat a theoretical cheese sandwich. Mm -hmm. so, so when you're making uh, judgments, decisions, totting things up, um, it's not as you describe it, I don't think. But, uh, but, you, but you don't need to know any of that to know about the idea of opportunity cost. Oh, no, no. Or, um, well, it's like someone's. Who was the man who said I've been? He found out he was speaking prose all of his life. Uh, I forget which. Some character. Always Jean-Jean. That's it. Mr. Jordan. Mr. Jordan. Yeah, Mr. Jordan. Yes. I know the music. Yes, he found he'd been speaking prose all his life, and uh, <laughs> I interspersed my bit of rubbish. Which one? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, backing up uh, David's point, which something, but uh, sorry, no, because, which is the, uh, it, 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 you know, it is hard to tell the difference between the, I, I always say there's a continuum between that priori and uh, oh. posteriori, but the, 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 the paradox of it is that we know that um, a priori economics uh, works is we checked in the world and we've seen that it does. <laughs> <laughs> a posteriori, my arse. Um, um, you know, well, we have checked. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, there's nothing in Mises' book that hasn't been checked to some extent. <clears throat> yes, yeah. I'll, 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 just, I'll just say quickly that um, you know, I, I still really don't understand the, the real, when you talk about the two dog, dogmas of empiricism. Yes, by far. I, I, I'm still at a loss to really explain the difference between empiricism and a priori stuff. I mean, especially when in the, in the, more, the light of um, <clears throat> modern learning theories like Piaget, where you go through stages of learning, right from uh, birth and so <laughs> forth. You, you, you're a priori, you could argue, you're a priori knowledge is actually empirical knowledge, really. It's, really yeah, it's, 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 it's empirically but, attained yes. through time and observation. And, and, and can yeah. you really but, distill the two things, really? I mean, how would an armchair economist come up with the Phillips curve, for example? Um, you know, it's, it's not something you can sift out. Phillips, <laughs> Phillips come up with it, didn't he? <laughs> he did, yeah, but it was a lot of work then. I don't think it did it's very good critical work. I think it's part of the Keynesian dogma. Mm. Weakness of mind, I think, was it? Possibly. Um. Yeah. And of course, it was refuted by it in 1975. But, uh, before then. But, so I mean, I'm sure a would agree with me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, if you can find another one. <laughs> He wouldn't be able to talk Isn't to another one. Yeah. That, was quite, Isn't that, another that was quite witty. That was quite, quite witty. For you. Yeah. Coming back to the sort of vast tomes that, for example, human actions of a thousand page brick shaped book. Yeah. Is that. And obviously, not everything in that is going to be correct. Well, it's possible, I suppose, it could be quite likely. Yeah. So, to the extent that it's not correct, is that because some of what Mises claimed to be our priori truth just aren't? 
went to wrong. Uh, yeah. 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 Or, or, or is that because he got the right truth, but then when he worked through all the detailed logical consequences, his deductive logic went wrong? Or is it something else? I, I, ask him. I think it was the second thing. It reminds me of Hobbes' and Spinoza, actually, because Hobbes uh, claimed to uh, uh, follow out on Euclid, uh, and, but he didn't pretend to do it in the book. Where Spinoza, following Hobbes, being a disciple of Hobbes, actually did try to do it almost right. Now, I think Hobbes <coughs> knew that he wasn't totally following Euclid. But I think Spinoza was deluded into thinking that he was following Euclid. But in any case, neither of them was following Euclid. But anyhow, I shouldn't be. No, no, you're, you're part of it. But you know, I, mean, I think the. Well, I mean, I was a, you know, I think, you know, I think the, the opportunity cost would be. You know, it's true that, that there would be an opportunity cost, it might be eight or right. But the actual cost of course, yeah. would, be, would be, be contingent. You know, that, that wasn't really what I meant, it's, it, it's that. Given that a lot of the, well, I say not, that some of what is in a book like Human Action is wrong. Oh, yes. Even though it is said, it could be wrong. said to arise out of a priori things that must be true, where does the book go wrong? And I'm not asking you about know, well, even Papa, it, but... even Papa made a mistake on this. Because Papa thought there was a difference between a priori and a posteriori. But Lachatosh, his PhD thesis, which was on the philosophy of mathematics, saw, in common with J.S. Mill to some extent, that mathematics was sort of empirical. It was a matter of conjecture and refutations. So he extended Popper's empirical philosophy into mathematics. And Poyne loved that. Poyne uh, wrote that such a fan letter, saying, you, you know, have you read my two dogmas? Of course, he had read his two dogmas. But you know, this, this is the area where you know, it's not easy to see which is a priori and what's a posterior right. But it is very important because otherwise one is back in the world of all the policy recommendation economists who say, well, you have to get the data out here. You know, the particular answer in the particular case depends on the data, and the data supports the suggestion in certain cases, minimum wage laws do a lot of good and tariffs do and so on and so forth. Uh, well, so it well, does it matter. But you've always got to get the data anyway. Uh, you know, even if you just, uh, uh, even if you just have pure mathematics, you've, you've got to test whether you're actually it's applicable to you yes. or something. So you've always got to get the data. I mean, you'll always have both. You'll always have to check the data and check the logic. Uh, but you know, the uh, I don't think it's a good case from human wise law. So the the priori claim. Yes, of course, you test it in terms of the logic whether it can stand up to what you say this is after all right, but. But the after all right claim and all the things that are said to follow in economics, for example, are, are not said to depend upon gathering data. I suppose, except in the sense you might say, well, you had a minimum wage law, and that was a disaster. So empirically, that suggests a refutation of the idea that, that it, it's a, a, a good thing. But the logic uh, of human action and the criticisms of it are they data dependent? In, in well, well I, think, I think the data have been collected, you see. I think uh, the economist collected this data, and Mises had this the thesis, exciting thesis, but I don't think it was a correct thesis, that it could all be done on geometry. Just like, uh, you know, uh, knows that the same sort of idea. Could build, and I don't think I think he's wrong for the exactly. I think <coughs> I think Coleridge said of Spinoza, you have to catch him at the bottom of page one, otherwise. <laughs> You have to accept everything that follows. Well, yeah. <laughs> sure. yeah, that's, what, that's what he pretended to be, but in actual fact, if you look at the ethics, it's far more empirical than Spinoza imagined. Two yeah. years, two years ago, before I lost some of my powers of concentration and continuity, that happens that happens with age. Um, I made a very good point about. Um, equilibrium and, uh, and coordination that um, uh, economists love the idea of equilibrium of course and I can sort, oh, of, yes. see, sort of see what they're about but I, I like the idea of coordination which doesn't which pretty much means in, that, in, the, in this world in which we live uh, you never get equilibrium and I even think equilibrium is not desirable 
in some of the senses as it, it is meant. Coordination simply means peaceful uh, production side by side, near and far, um, where we, there's no war, there's no um, agreement as to who should be producing and who shouldn't be producing. There is simply um, uh, a harmony, and this is back to Bastia in a sense, that it's not invasive, it's try it, if you, you know, if you like it, try it, if you don't like it, don't try it again. That kind of, that kind of approach to life. And um, that's why I like, that's why I call myself a bit, I compare myself to Bastia, because he thought there was no need for a theory of how best to run it. A country, an economy, a whatever, a, ru a, a realm. Uh, you let people, you have security, property, you have keeping your promises, and that pretty much is it. That was Hume as well. Well, there's a lot of that about, wasn't it? Obviously, Adam Smith, yes. So that was their view. Now, but they didn't bring in the idea of equilibrium. I, I don't care, tums for um, demand um, diagrams and. Uh, I did enough. There's another chap who hates the and and supply curves and Kinds. the rest of it. Well, you know, we're used to the idea that you know you can have some. I know it's not satiation. That's different. People sometimes confuse the idea that you know you have one extra drink and then another drink and then you don't want any more. It doesn't always work with that. With some people, <laughs> they want even more. But yes, it's not satiation. It's that you've got better things to do with your purchasing yes, power. Right, yeah. At a certain point, you'd rather have something else. But uh, Bastia thought, and this puzzles some, that, to get back to my opening remarks, it was thought that he had no theory at all. He was not a theorist. That's Schumpeter, yeah. That's Schumpeter. And my view is he was a theorist. No, I had a, His theory was that there didn't have to be a theory beyond why people do this, why they do that, why they do that. Because it's going to integrate. It's going to integrate if it, in a peaceful coexistence met analysis that I like to pull out, although there's not going to be equilibrium such that all firms are making profits, no firms are making super profits, no firms are making losses, each one is getting the average return, which ends up being equal to the interest rate. You know, that kind of idea. Well, I don't think that's... Most economists would agree that that's not attained always, or even desirable, well, the same speak as if it is. But the point is, it need not be. The important thing is there's peaceful coexistence of, of competitors. You don't attack each other. You don't, well, you shouldn't. You may think, you know, you may try and rubbish another, another, another product, but of course, you have to prove it by being thought by the public to be superior. So I, I, I like the idea of um, a peaceful coexistence but uh, I've never, I've never cared for demand diagrams, and well, we know what it, what it means. But beyond that, I, I don't, because this is trying to get the maths in. This is trying to make it look like a real science. Yeah, that's yeah, that's the main man. Yeah, behind that. Yeah. yeah. And I don't think that's necessary. You can be a first-class economist like Bastier, and yet, what? What? No diagrams? No, no numbers? Apart from page numbers, I don't think there are any numbers. But... And yet, well, John? well, the old joke is that the mathematics and economics in introduced rigor, unfortunately, also introduced more. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, it is new to me, and it's a good As I said earlier, you know, one of the chief chaps who really was keen on mathematics, apart from something, was Wicksteed. And uh, you won't find an English economist which is more prized by the Ashmans than Wicksteed. They know him. He's one of us, they say. But he was dead keen on mathematics, as was Jevons. Well, it looks real. And of course, his book, as I said, his book, The Common Sense of Political Economy, is calculus without the simples. And it's possible to describe any theory, I suppose, in mathematical type terms. The question is whether there's any benefit in doing so. Well, Wixley thought there was, and Rizzi loved Wixley. <laughs> Although he hated mathematics. Wixley loved mathematics, and Rizzi hated them, but uh, of course, loved Wixley. Of course, Rizzi's had a brother. Richard, who loved, who was a <laughs> professor of mathematics. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he says, he says, I all our stuff is complete rubbish, he says, Richard. Yeah. Well, they're fun brothers. Well, I should have thought of maths. Well, they're our odds. 
I said, I thought in that it's entirely applicable, isn't it? April? The yeah. idea that. Oh, well, yes, it's geometry. Yeah. Huh? Set. Well, yes, yeah, set theory. And they'd set against it. Oh. Uh, uh, That's settled. Uh, any other questions? Sorry to. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased you widened the debate then. Oh, well, thanks, Bob. I've got to mess things up in students. It's in the case away sometimes. <laughs> we will. <laughs> in a van. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Is this a meeting official? Is there anyone else who wants to speak? <coughs> oh, well, thank you, Bob, again then. Thank you very much indeed, Bob.